So I thought I'd just start off by explaining a little bit about what English heritage and historic England um, are, because I think people are confused um, about what the, those two bodies actually amount to. So if we go back to 2008, uh, we had um, the setting up then of the Royal Commission on Historic Monuments of England. And that was associated with the Ancient Monuments Board of the Office of Works. So that then over time becomes English Heritage uh, as a non-departmental government body, which is under the DCMS, the Department of Culture, Media and Sports, as an arm's length body. Now, about, uh, I suppose it must be six years ago, English Heritage was split in what was called the new model. So what is now called English Heritage is a charity which operates the properties like Audley End under license. And it's a seven year license, which runs up to 2023. And the idea is that English Heritage becomes like the National Trust, self-funding, um, a charity uh, removed from the, the, the government and therefore can set its own salaries and, and raise money philanthropically. Unfortunately, um, of course, it doesn't have the endowment of the National Trust and it's been hit by COVID. Um, the one major site which earns money is Stonehenge. 75% of the visitors at Stonehenge come from overseas, mainly cruise ships from Southampton. So you can understand that English heritage is in a little bit of a, of a financial difficulty. What the second part then, then is, is Historic England. <clears throat> now I'm a commissioner on Historic England, which um, has about 12 commissioners. Uh, so I'm the historian, there's an archeologist, there's a former uh, president of the Royal Institute of British Archaeologists, there's property developers and so on. So it's uh, outsiders who act as an advisory body for Historic England. And I chair HEAC, the Historic England Advisory Committee, which deals with, with casework. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do at HEAC, largely about what we mean by heritage. <clears throat> So if we go back to the beginning of the organisation in 1908 and the Office of Works and its uh, and that board I mentioned of ancient monuments, it was ancient monuments. It was basically castles and ruined abbeys which had been knocked about a bit and were there, then had what I call the Office of Works aesthetics. Um, everything was cleaned up, um, the grass was trimmed, there were keep off the grass notices and there you have Orford Castle and, and Revo Abbey. Revo Abbey was largely rebuilt by inserting bits of railway line to hold up the arches and filled with concrete. So in those days, we knew what heritage meant. I think it's fair to say we no longer actually know what heritage means and it's very deeply contested. And I don't just mean contested over statues which have been in the news uh, very recently. There's one thing that we have to look at is what's called heritage at risk. So in extremis, if a building is actually falling down, then Historic England can purchase it and renovate it. Uh, one of the most famous examples of that was um, Apthorpe House, which is not so far away from here. But this is one which we're currently involved in, I'm on the advisory body of this one, which is the flax mill at Shrewsbury. It claims to be the oldest iron framed building in the world and it's being sold to the public as the forerunner of skyscrapers. Uh, and this was the, the floor uh, on which uh, the machinery operated, steam powered machinery, uh, spinning yarn for, for flax. It's being renovated, this ground floor will be uh, a museum. Uh, we're just trying to design it at the moment. And then the upper floors will be offices and at the front, the um, commercial development of housing to try and cover what is called the conservation deficit on the whole property. So it's um, quite a, a large scale um, and exciting 
project. Um, now, in other cases, we don't take over the whole building, but we give a grant to repair buildings. Uh, one which is done last week was to the museum in Wisbech, which is given a grant of £616,000 to stop the, um, the, the roof falling, it's, it's, it's leaking. So that's in extremis what we do. We actually buy and renovate buildings, but it's incredibly risky at, at the moment trying to make sure that that housing is being, being sold as a joint development with Homes England, um, Shropshire County Council. Now, this is an example, of course, of Shrewsbury Flax Mill, which became a maltings um, later on in life, um, of a piece of industrial heritage. So that's another aspect of the work that we're doing. Uh, one of the debates we've had recently at um, HIAC is what do we mean by industrial heritage? So we should be now preserving and renovating not only Orford Castle or Revo Abbey, but also the great monuments of the Industrial Revolution. And what do we do about it? Well, one that we're looking at at the moment is Chatterley Whitfield Colliery uh, near Stoke. Uh, this stopped being a coal mine back in the 1970s and it opened in its museum, it actually went, went down it. You could still go down with uh, former miners who'd explain how it all worked. But since then, the, the mines have flooded. And here is the surviving pithead gear. It's the only major surviving pithead gear left in the country from what was one of Britain's major industries. So what are we going to do about it? Um, well, currently it's, it's being looked after by a charity which has very limited money, but there's a large site around it. So we've had a number of reports uh, recently commissioned and there are some precedents of what to do. Like in Germany, this is the Zolverein coal mine industrial complex in Essen, which had been turned into a sort of theme park with skating rinks and helter skelters. And it looks a little bit like uh, the Pompidou Center in, in Paris. So that's a new sort of aesthetic, an industrial ruin aesthetic. Or here, the Landschaftspark in, in Duisburg. Uh, which again has been turned into uh, a nature reserve uh, with all of the uh, Bessemer converters left intact. So one idea is to try and turn Chatterley Whitfield Colliery into something like this, but also to say that the coal mine was at the heart of the first industrial revolution based upon coal. Now it should be at the heart of the green industrial revolution. So the idea is that the mine is used as a very large um, ground source heat pump um, with the water down the mine heating up to 30 or 40 degrees centigrade and then using heat exchangers and pumps and having an industrial park um, in some of the other buildings on the site and also using the heat to, um, for domestic heating for a large housing development found about and then connecting that into Stoke along um, for railway lines and canals and making it a, a green, sustainable development. So one of the major things is how to reuse heritage in a way which is suitable for this century and the next. So we're not just looking back, we're trying to look forward. So industrial heritage is, is a major um, area. But on top of that, it's a matter of looking at towns around the country like Kings Lynn and setting up heritage action zones uh, which as you see at the, in the strap line there is getting new development to work with historic Lynn to reinforce its identity and the government has just given uh, historic England another large sum of money for the regeneration of historic high streets so that money was given before uh, Covid hit when historic high streets were already suffering. Uh, now, of course, there's an even bigger problem. How do you regenerate old city centres post-COVID? So uh, there's a number of places around the, the country where, where we're trying to do that. 
uh, one is um, Great Yarmouth. Uh, so uh, that's very much in the in the early stages of what we're we're trying to do. And if you see here, that's one of the uh, recent schemes uh, in the Heritage Action Zone in Kings Lynn, improving the paving, uh, reducing the traffic flow, making it much more attractive to uh, to walk around and to um, understand the, the the architecture. So, industrial heritage, heritage action zones, high streets. It's a long way now from Revo and Orford Castle. But let's go even further. Stonehenge. <clears throat> so the the next uh, set of issues relates to what are called world heritage sites. Now there's a problem here. World heritage sites are run by, or designated by UNESCO, the United Nations Education, uh, Science and Culture Organization, which is based in Paris. And associated with that is another body called ICOMOS, the International Council on Monuments and Sites. Now, Obviously, it's very important to make sure we preserve world heritage sites like the pyramids or Machu Picchu or where, wherever it might be. But there's a different philosophy followed by UNESCO from what we do in this country. In this country, our philosophy in looking after heritage is what's called constructive conservation. That is, don't let it be frozen in time. Things change, history is about change and not simply keeping something in aspic. Unfortunately, UNESCO's view is that things must never change. So you have a collision of two philosophies. And the problem there is that Britain's assigned a treaty with UNESCO. So it's, one has to be, be careful about not breaking a treaty obligation. So this brings me to Stonehenge. You might have all have been reading in the press and on the news about the A303, which you see here, which has mainly been dual carriageway down to Southampton, but not the bit which goes past Stonehenge. And the traffic thunders past Stonehenge and cuts the stones off from the surrounding landscape where there's other parts of the archeology span of uh, burial sites, um, burial mounds, there's an avenue and so on. So the idea is, uh, and it was, a, it was approved last year, at the end of last year by the government, was to build a tunnel at a cost of, well, at the moment it's about two billion pounds, uh, but it's likely to go up, and, uh, or just beside Stonehenge. The idea then is you can walk from stones across what was this busy road, into the rest of the landscape, which is originally part of the whole complex. This is deeply contentious. Um, I've twice walked, uh, walked around the site and can see how it would work with the, with the tunnel. Unfortunately, of course, you have to have an entrance into the tunnel and the opponents of the scheme say that that will destroy archeology. span The view of historic England and the National Trust and English Heritage who are also involved in this is that it will not destroy any heritage. The opponents say it will change the water table and who knows what that might do to other waterlogged uh, bits of archaeology round about. So here we have the opponents, the Save Stonehenge World Heritage Site, and of course they show different images of how there's going to be massive scars in the landscape, destruction of the uh, of, of heritage. Last week, the opponents applied to the High Court to have judicial review. So it might now all be delayed yet again, while there's a judicial review challenging the evidence which Historic England has given in favour of it. And the second uh, World Heritage Site issue that I will mention is this one, Bramley Moor Docks. Uh, this is part of the Liverpool Maritime World Heritage Site. 
Uh, you probably all know or have seen pictures of the Albert Docks where Teg Liverpool is. It's a really bustling, thriving area, at least it used to be before COVID, of restaurants, galleries, and various venues that the Beatles uh, Museum, the Museum of Liverpool, the three greatest on the pier head. But as you go up the Mersey, you end up at the Bramley Moor Docks, which is also part of the World Heritage Site. Uh, it's part of the complex designed by Jesse Hartley, the great dock engineer. You have this wall which runs all the way up the docks to make sure people weren't stealing the very valuable commodities. Um, and you have the pumping station for the hydraulic works, for the dock gates and so on here. So this is the World Heritage Site. Uh, the dock walls here are all uh, listed and protected by UNESCO. And here you have uh, the, what is, I think, euphemistically called the water treatment plant, uh, better known as the sewage works. Uh, the line is just in front of the sewage works for the World Heritage Site. Now, that's not Stonehenge, but it's protected. So if anything is done to it, then it breaks the treaty with UNESCO. And that's what Everton Football Club want to put on that very site. Now, I went up there to look at this uh, with a number of other people on HEAC, including uh, leading architects. And we made various suggestions of how it could be changed. This is the revised scheme. Initially, it was going to be a multi-story car park here on the riverfront. There's very strong winds here. We're just wondering how on earth it would be feasible. And the entrance to the car park would be through that dock wall alongside the stadium, uh, one assumed knocking down a large number of Everton supporters on the way to the car park. We suggested that that was not a good idea. And as you see, they have changed it. So now there is a uh, promenade here. Um, we've also suggested that the leading building across the road from the family Moor Dock is this tobacco warehouse, which has just been converted into luxury apartments. And we said that the stadium should not be higher than this, and it should mimic it in some way or refer to it. Hence, this block alongside the stadium, which is copying the tobacco warehouse, but also putting brickwork, a design in the brickwork, which picks up the steel trusses, which are used in the old Everton Stadium at Goodison Park. The architects on the panel were still not too happy about the design of this roof. Uh, a bit too shiny, uh, but uh, that's what has just been approved last week. The whole thing has been approved by Liverpool City Council. HEAC was very much part of the attempt to design it and had a very good relationship with Everton and Liverpool City Council. But we couldn't say that we approved it because in approving it, we will be going against the UNESCO treaty. We also have to say that any decision made by Liverpool to approve it must then be called in by the Secretary of State for final approval, because that is what's required by the treaty with UNESCO. But of course, what then happened is that at Liverpool City Council, at a unanimous vote to approve the building of the football stadium, said that the uh, commissioners of Historic England and the members of HEAC were preventing the regeneration of Liverpool, preventing uh, creation of employment in Liverpool, and that uh, we were basically a negative force preventing the levelling up agenda. Now, one can understand why they say that, but of course, we were also had our hands tied, and we were going as far as we could with them in helping the design. Ultimately, this is a point I'll be coming on to again later on, what we have to do at Historic England and at HEAC is make a judgment on the aesthetics 
on the heritage value, we don't make a judgment on the public benefit. And the assessment of whether the public benefit outweighs the loss to the heritage is to be made by democratically elected bodies like Liverpool City Council and ultimately by the Secretary of State. So we can only say there is more or less heritage loss is for others to say whether or not there is a heritage, whether or not there is a public benefit. Um, I better not say, uh, since it's under sort of subdue to say what my view would be on this. I guess I outlined the uh, the position that's been publicly taken by Historic England. Now, I'm saying that as a background to what you might think of as being the uh, real um, point of the contested heritage title of my, my presentation. Here we have a certainly uh, extreme view of contested heritage. The throwing of the statue of Colston into the docks in Bristol. And this has led, of course, to a lot of debate in the press, um, a lot of comment by uh, Oliver Dowden, the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport, and Robert Jenrick, uh, the Secretary of State for Communities and Housing. Um, and they referred um, in one uh, recent intervention to baying mobs um, throwing statues off their plinths. Well, you can see what they mean in, in this case. Now, the view of historic England is that the policy to be adopted is what we call retain and explain. And that policy has been adopted by the government. That's fine. Uh, I've, I've in the past, it, not in the capacity of being a commissioner of historic England, um, argued in favour of what I call erudition rather than erasure as we understand things, we explain them uh, rather than overturning them. Now clearly views on this are incredibly strong. Again, it's for historic England to say what the cultural significance or heritage value is of an object. Colson statue is listed as grade two. So we have to say, would removing it from its plinth perhaps putting it in a museum, cause uh, a substantial or less than substantial heritage loss. So we have to make that, that decision. One of the problems is though, what do we mean by explain? So that's the, our, our stated position at Historic England, is the stated position of the government, but we've not yet worked out what is meant by explain. Um, there's also a point that uh, an object can have what is called negative cultural value. In other words, as well as having a heritage value celebrating something, it could potentially have negative cultural value of undermining people's sense of uh, or identity and so on. So different countries have taken different views on this. In Germany, you cannot show anything to do with the Nazi party. In Spain, not so long ago, it decided that anything to do with Franco had to be removed. So different countries have taken different views. In uh, Hungary and in the former Soviet Union, statues have been moved to be put into museum parks. So, what do we do in this country? So there are different views in different, different places. So we could have a uh, look at some of these um, in more detail in, in question and answer if you wish. The case about Colston is that he was a director of the Royal Africa Company. And the Royal Africa Company was a major slave trading company from the late 17th century into the 18th century. Now, before he was toppled uh, in this, this way by people taking 
action. There had been an architectural competition to try and decide whether or not he could be explained by keeping him where he was. And this was a design that was developed by one firm of architects. Uh, this is just a design, it was a, uh, this is a mock-up. Uh, the idea was to create a sort of ship, like a slave ship uh, in the park, and then around the statue to put the very famous etching, which is done by the abolitionists of the slaves being laid down in the hold of the ship on the, in the middle passages they were going to uh, the uh, Caribbean. Now, that was not, not done, but is that what we mean by explain? Or do we mean having a QR code beside the statue? So with your mobile phone, you could click on that and get a full explanation of why that person is being celebrated or why some people think that person should not be celebrated, explaining the historical context. Does one mean putting up a plaque beside it with some text on it to explain uh, what that person was and why they were they were commemorated and why some people don't like them. So explain has not yet been explained about what should be done. And this is really a burning issue at the at the moment. Um, and we have we've just had one long discussion at commission and at PIAC, and we have another one coming up. Last week, there was a meeting of cultural organizations with the Secretary of State. Uh, again, explained that retain and explain is the policy, but now having to try and give it some uh, real context. Uh, that's what the architects of the contextualizing Colston statue uh, have, to, have to say. They wanted to create an open contemplative space in which people could understand uh, the, the nature of Colston and to give the traded slaves in that um, image around the statue an individuality using different materials. So anyway, that was one, one idea. Uh, to, to the protesters, the wording, the current wording on the statue uh, was not acceptable because it referred to Colston as being one of the most virtuous and wise sons of their city. When he created a school, uh, that was certainly virtuous. He traded slaves, not virtuous. People are mixed. They have uh, different, you know, they're gray, not black and white. How does one try and get that over? Now, I'm going to turn now to um, perhaps a rather different um, person than the ones you saw there in the demonstrators in Bristol, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, this is from the BBC website, and the Archbishop has said that church statues should be reviewed very carefully uh, to see if they should be there at all. Now, there's a stained glass window to Colston in Bristol Cathedral that has been removed. So, the Archbishop is saying some will have to come down. Now, that's not retain, is it? And memorialized should be forgiven only if there is justice, he said. That's moving into another very complicated philosophical and theological um, thing about how does, how do these, how does, what does we mean by justice? Uh, how does one uh, overcome the harm that's been done back in the, in the past? How does one give forgiveness? Uh, how does one grant it? That is what he's asking for. Now that's perhaps moving far beyond the remit of historic England, but is it? This is an example which has just come up in Cambridge at Jesus College, where the Dean of um, of Jesus College, James Crawford, <clears throat> has applied with the support of the fellowship to the Diocese of Ely to remove a memorial that's in the chapel to Tobias Rustat uh, of Rustat Road fame. It's in the college chapel. They want to take it down 
and relocate it in due course, notice in due course, not immediately, to an educational exhibition space, which is a converted wine cellar. So they're going to put it there in an exhibition space and explain it. They're going to rename certain other parts of the college. There's a Rustat seminar, there's a Rustat feast, there's Rustat is named on various commemorative plaques. Rustat, like Colston, was the director of the Royal African Company. So here we are. The church, the Archbishop of Canterbury thinks that some of these memorials should be removed. Jesus College is applied to for it to be removed. It goes to the Diocese of Ely outside the planning system of the secular state and therefore outside the control of the Secretary of State, Oliver Dowden and Robert Jenrick. But they have said that this is a test case. The problem is, however, that they don't have any jurisdiction. However, Historic England has to advise the Diocese of Ely whether or not we approve of the re removal of this plaque, this memorial, from the chapel. And there it is. There's Rustat um, at the top uh, with the wording below, which says that his wealth was acquired by his labours and by the grace of God. Now, to some people, that is uh, not altogether accurate since large part of his revenue came from the labour of others who were enslaved. There's no doubt, though, that this uh, memorial is a fine piece of work. It's by the studio of Greenland Gibbons, one of the greatest artists, uh, carvers, mainly in wood, but also in stone, of the late 17th century. So there it is. Should it be retained on the wall? The dean of the chapel says that every time he raises uh, the communion, the chalice, and the host, he looks straight at this memorial to a slave owner. Uh, the students are not happy. They say that in a space which is about contemplation and pastoral care, that they don't like the major object there <clears throat> being of a slave owner. So the, this came to HIAC as chairman's action that I had to decide what to say about this. And of course one says this is a major piece of art. There would be aesthetic damage if it were moved. It is for somebody else to decide about the public benefit. But you can understand why that some people would say that uh, that is temporizing. That at some point, perhaps, a monument is so offensive that retention is not appropriate. And here is, here is another case where some people say that retention should not be accepted at all within the church. This is in the church at Dorchester, down in Dorset. The uh, parochial church council at Dorchester has applied to the Diocese of Salisbury for this to be removed. So the point of view from Historic England is, of course, this is not such a fine piece of aesthetic, aesthetics as the previous one, so removing it would not cause such aesthetic harm. The idea here at the church in Dorchester is that they move this into the county museum, which is more or less next door, where they can explain it more thoroughly. Now let's just look at what that means. What do we mean by explain there? Let's look at the, the text on this. So this is for a man called John Gordon who was a major slave owner in Jamaica. He'd come home to England, and then he was on his way back to Jamaica, where he died in Dorchester. He had no connection with Dorchester. In fact, he died on the way back. 
he'd resided for many years in Jamaica in universal esteem. Well, of course, glossing that universal esteem by the people who were slave owners rather than the slaves. Then it goes on to say he was signally instrumental in quelling a dangerous rebellion in 1760. And a large body of Negroes yielded to his humanity. Right, so then we have to try and work out what's going on there. 1760 was the major slave rebellion in the Caribbean. It really scared the, uh, the, the white settlers in, in the area. It was the major rebellion before uh, the, the, end, the end of slavery. It was called Tacky's Rebellion in 1760. So presumably in explaining this, one would have to say what Tacky's Rebellion is. Now this is when it becomes really interesting. And again, much more gray and complicated than might be imagined from those people who say, well, look, let's just take this down. This is a, this is a, a really sort of insulting piece of, of, of text on, on here, which doubtless it is, no doubt it is. But how was Tacky's Rebellion put down? Well, it was suppressed in part by the, the uh, group of free blacks in Jamaica who were called the Maroons. The Maroons were the former slaves and their descendants of the Spanish who had been defeated by the British, and also some escaped slaves from the British settlers. So they were living in the, in the hills and mountains of Jamaica. And in 1739, they struck a deal with the white slave owners that if any slaves escaped, they would round them up and return them to the slave owners. And the Maroons, the free blacks, played a major role in putting down the rebellion, Tacky's Rebellion. Then it becomes even more complicated because Tacky had been, before he was captured and, and transported across the Atlantic, he had been uh, a chieftain or a prince in Africa. When he defeated rivals of, of neighboring groups, he sold the defeated prisoners to the British until he was himself defeated and sold by his, the people who'd beaten him into captivity. So what we have here is a very complicated set of relationships uh, between different groups in the area. So what we then need to understand is who was being sent from um, the Caribbean, so, so across the, uh, the Atlantic from Africa to the Caribbean. And here we have some really uh, wonderful new uh, historical data, which is called the Slave Voyages Database. It's been computerized, all the slave voyages from uh, Portugal, Spain, France, and Britain have been put into a database. So you know every single ship, uh, who, how many people died. You see on average 12% of slaves died on the passage. We also see here that 64.5% of them were male. Then that leads to the question of, well, why were there so many men being sent across the, uh, the middle passage? And historians then have started to work out the demography of this and started to work out, well, partly it was because male field hands were more valuable and more productive straight away. Uh, but it's also because the people who were being uh, rounded up in Africa to be sent over reflected various gendered criminal, uh, disruptive behavior roles, prisoners of war within Africa. And also that there was a, a slave trade within Africa from the, uh, the Bight of Benin up to North Africa of female slaves. So one has to try and understand the middle passage within the context of what is happening within Africa. So how does one explain all of that? Uh, you can see how very complicated it uh, would, uh, would become. So what do we mean by retain? What do we mean by 
explain? Does retain mean keeping it exactly where it is in the church or moving it somewhere else in the church, into a museum, into uh, a, an exhibition space? What does one explain? Who explains it? Uh, you can understand a lot of this is incredibly complicated. And I'd like now to pick up this uh, set of other set of data, which is the legacies of British slave ownership database. When slavery was abolished uh, in 1833, the act was passed in 1833, abolished in 1834, the existing slave owners were compensated for the slaves. They were given a large sum of money. It was the largest sum of money paid out by the British state for anything in the 19th, 19th century. Uh, it was a massive sum of money. We know then how many slaves people owned. Uh, we, we, can, we can find out that that man in, a, in Dorchester owned 416 slaves from uh, his probate inventory. And that's been linked into this legacy of British slave ownership. So it's now possible to find out how much money there was being raised from the abolition of slavery and where it went. One can then start to write that back into the listing which Historic England has done. And let me give you one example of this and you can think whether or not you believe this is an appropriate thing to do or not. Chippenham Park. Uh, which is just up the road near Newmarket. You've probably been there to see the daffodils and snowdrops and so on in the in the grounds there. It's a very attractive village high street. Uh, and the house there was bought in 1791 by John Tharp. He paid £40,000 for the house. If you look at the website uh, of the house, is it, of the current owners, it's described as being bought by a hugely successful sugar baron. But of course, sugar barons in Jamaica were slave owners. And when slavery was abolished, and you look up that slavery uh, database, the, the heir of John Tharp owned 2,375 slaves. So the house and the gardens were uh, paid for by slavery. Now, if you look currently at the listing in the uh, Historic England listing of grade two buildings, it doesn't mention that. If you look in Pevsner's Guide to the Buildings of England, it doesn't. If you look at the plaque on the village high street, given the history of the village, this is not mentioned. The involvement with slavery didn't stop actually in 1833, 1834. In 1865, there was a major uprising of the free blacks in Jamaica, the Morant Bay Rebellion of 1865, because they were wanted to have various rights uh, to vote, to say in their lives. And it was put down by the governor, Governor Eyre, and about, I think, 200 people were shot. Governor Eyre was then tried for murder and two bodies were set up one to defend him the governor of air defense committee which included charles dickens john ruskin and thomas carlyle on the other hand the jamaica committee said that he was guilty of murder charles darwin henry fawcett uh, whose uh, memorial plaque is on uh, uh, brookside leslie stephen uh, former fellow at Trinity Hall and the rector of one of the churches in Cambridge. So the point I'm making here is that slavery divided people at the time, abolitionists against slave owners. It continues to divide people right into the 19th century. The owner of Chippenham Park was a supporter of Governor Eyre. So things were contentious in the past. They remain contentious. How do we explain that? Oliver Dowden has said that we have a shared history. But of course, the shared history is one in which there was contention and division. 
how does one explain that in a nuanced manner? And what Oliver Dowden says is that we must do that. It is complicated. But of course, it then gets wrapped up into a, a sort of cultural war. And uh, that's uh, what uh, we must try and avoid becoming destructive and, and harmful. Now, moving along from that into the future, uh, this is my final point, which is the government white paper planning for the future. There on the left, you see the, the, the cover of it, which is out for consultation. <clears throat> and next week, Historic England is having a whole day consultation on it. We've already made a preliminary report response to it. And this emerges from a previous report, a report of the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission, which is part of the DCMS and so on. And this report is called Living with Beauty. There we have the, uh, the Peace Hall at Halifax and various other properties. So the man who wrote this report and chairs, chairs it is also a commissioner of Historic England. So we're in a slightly difficult position of perhaps saying that we don't agree with his approach. Um, anyway interested to see what what happens about about that now what is behind this um report well just very very briefly it's out for consultation so if you wish you can send your your own views in i think it has a it has many virtues but it also has some problems the major issue here is to move from discretion that is every application for a change of uh, a listed building or a change you know, building a new town or whatever uh, is discretional at the moment it goes to the planning committee the idea this should become rules based rules should be laid down and if the rules are met then uh, there should be approval and that is what happens in the rest of europe there should be three zones for development areas should be designated for growth the substantial redevelopment for renewal, suitable for, for development, but not substantial development, or protect. So you divide all the country up into those three areas. Once that has been decide, des, decided, then there is a presumption for development in that growth area. It's designed to speed it up. The housing needs for each area will be set by an algorithm designed by the government. And then there will be automatic approval if the it is in line with the plan. So it will take away a lot of uh, this discretionary uh, consultation at the moment. And there should be front loading of evidence. That is to say, before anybody applies to build a new town, like at Six Mile Bottom or wherever it might be, there should be design code to fast track for beauty. And that code should be prepared locally with community involvement to decide what is popular and characteristic of the local area. And then should allow pre-approval of popular and replicable development in accordance with patent books. But then, of course, people might say, well, if it's according to a standardized patent book, how are you going to have a fast track for beauty, which might mean something unique and individual? Uh, is this actually undermining local autonomy and democracy? And who is going to say, what is beauty? Is beauty Prince Charles's development, the Duchy of Cornwall development of Poundbury, which most architects think is um, a pastiche. The Daily Express had the headline saying, is this a feudal Disneyland? Or is it locally here to Cambridge, the new development up at Eddington, uh, up Huntington Road. There you have the community centre, which uh, one uh, cynic said was a, a home for giraffes. There's the entrance. Uh, and here's the housing, a little bit like as what's being built down at Marley 
or the Accordia development. So is your beauty that or that? And who is going to decide? Well, perhaps that is something which parish councils can try and work out in the years to come. Thank you.